Hello and welcome once again to White Lotus of Light conversational series. This is part two of episode three of the Black Nobility series uh, with the in inestimable Philip oh. Jimenez. <laughs> I keep boosting him up even more. I'm trying to embarrass him and I think it's working. Um, I do. Yeah. Just, I hold Philip in such high esteem. I think I hold Philip in considerably higher esteem than then Philip holds himself, which is a crying shame because oh. Philip is a, uh -huh. is a scholar and a gentleman. He really is. And so, um, uh, Philip, last well, week... Well, it's mutual. Oh, thank you so much. So, uh, Philip, with the last episode, we were um, we're talking about, we're doing like kind of a, it's a deep, deep subject. It's kind of a, um, a mini subject within the Black nobility that it has profound implications to modernity. We're talking about in part part one of episode three, which I recommend viewer, and I'll put a little card up there so you can just click on it. I've learned, I'm, I'm learning, I'm learning. It takes a while, old dog, new tricks, but I'll put a card up there, which will be up there right now that you can click on and go watch part one, because I think with this one, you do really kind of need to watch part one. And, and if you're new to the series somehow, then you definitely want to watch episode one and two. I think that this series uh, does require actually I think episode one is very important unlike some of the other shows I do I think that there is um, not strictly a chronological order but there's a contextual order to uh, a cumulative effect yeah a cumulative effect. and so we're talking about the Guelphs and the Ghibellines uh, which were a uh, faction uh, in between like basically close to 1200 AD to close to 1400 AD uh, in medieval uh uh, Italy that led to a whole host of uh, of other events that um, inform our modern world. And so in uh, part one of this episode three, we were um, we had talked about Dante Alighieri, uh, the great author of the Divine Comedy. Most people know specifically Dante's Inferno is probably the most famous work, which is a um, subset of the Divine Comedy. And uh, what I did not know, and Philip informed me, was that Dante Alighieri helped uh, take uh, Latin and, and turn it into the, the beginnings of modern Italian as we know it today. And how yeah, he was an advocate, yeah, yeah, an advocate of what he called the vernacular and he against uh, lots of objections. It wasn't like there were a lot of people. Uh, on his side and in, in this issue he really went it alone and he insisted no this is it we've got to go this way mm -hmm. we've got to, we've got to develop a modern italian language that's flexible and that can give rise to new mental forms and unleash creativity and there was a significant opposition to mm -hmm. what he was doing mm -hmm. as we said in part one there's a certain historical analogy and analogy and one of the things i want people to understand about this entire series is we're not doing this for academic historical reasons even though it is very in a certain way academic and historically based um we're trying to point to patterns in history the roots of current events can be found in history even ancient history as it turns out um you know past tells future as they say and um you know, one thing I want to tie to Philip's point here about Dante Alighieri and the vernacular and the uh, uh, movement from uh, Latin to modern Italian that we talk about in part one, but just to refresh the viewer's memory is that if you look, language is critically important uh, in current unfolding events, in particular in the cancel culture movement and the attempts to redefine uh, very straightforward and basic terms, such as uh, attempting to redefine gender as biological sex, which is not the same thing at all. Gender is, in fact, fluid and is changeable. So biological sex is very much not, unless you're in that 0.04% or whatever it is that's intersex. Um, the idea that uh, a man and a woman is something that we're going to, or a boy and a girl is something that we're going to completely redefine away from biological sex uh, is... Um, really attacking language at its fundamental root. Um, and, and it has a lot less to do with someone having rights, uh, which I support fully, and I believe Philip does as well, uh, that I believe all trans people should have equal rights, gay people, straight people, you know, Hindu, Muslim, Jewish, whatever you might be, you should have equal rights and equal opportunity under the law. I very much believe in that. Uh, but the 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 so-called trans right movement is actually being used as Trojan horse vehicle to get in this uh, attack on language 
and therefore to uh, make the narrative, once you make language more fungible and redefine it at a very fundamental level, such as biological sex, trying to redefine that, uh, it allows for a huge change in a whole array of the ways that we understand the world because we understand the world through our senses and then we cognize it through language. And we talk about that a lot in part one. And so, Philip, tell us about, uh, so Dante does the defense of the vernacular, and then what did that lead to directly in your estimation in terms of the, the black and white Guelphs, which is where I think we were kind of focusing on at the end of the last episode? Yeah, well, uh, I think the depreciation of reason is the big, most dangerous fallout from <clears throat> all of this. You know, look at the, look at the gender issue. Uh, let's just look at it logically it's it's male and female <coughs> some some people feel themselves to be a, a mixture of the two but it's still male and female it's like there's red and blue yes there's purple but is purple really a new color is it a it, every you could have infinite shades of purple and label each one of them but in the end it's still the dynamic it's still the male female dynamic and yeah it's a trojan horse for a lot of things depopulation Yep, uh, is number one, and well, the ability to ins- from the pharmaceutical company, yeah, enslave people, enslaving people, and profiteering. Um, it it's really incredible. This core identity, which allows you to be more uh, hmm. uh, uh, receptive to brainwashing. Actually, sure, sure. I mean, you know, what we are in terms of our our gender, our ethnicity. Uh, what we are politically, uh, I mean, this accounts for just a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of the, the infinite selves uh, that we are. But certainly we see what it's all about is the uh, the urgency behind this oligarchical agenda to, to have total control over people, which, as we see, is, is uh, nothing new. You had... Um, Going back to the the time period uh, that we're dealing with, you had you know they talk about the um, uh, you know the the Middle Ages, the pre Renaissance period of of ignorance um, and and uh, backwardness, but actually there was a, a lot of uh, improvements and progress made during the 12th and 13th century, and you had an increase in the population rising from uh, 58 million in 1100 to 79 million in 1250, uh, with also a a rapid increase in uh, urbanization and lots of new towns and cities and new technologies, power generation technologies, which was... was, uh, water wheels and, and windmills and you had uh, burgeoning of uh, mining and agriculture of course the venetians were master ship builders but um so you all you know a major part of this was bringing in new technologies from from china and the arab world but it was this kind of progress which made the the uh, the emergence of Dante within this tremendously uh, rich environment that was Florence made this possible. But you still had, it's like when things get too good, you know, like we saw this in the United States, too much prosperity, too many possibilities opening up for the middle class. What do we got to do? We've got to smash that. You know, the Club of Rome comes in and says, you know, we got to really take, get, uh, uh, knock out their steel uh, industry we got to knock out their manufacturing we got to start bringing down that middle class they're going to be a real problem so you had back then oh you know europe you still had this very fragmented oligarchical society but by the middle of the 13th century you had that upward curve had been uh, com- uh completely uh, uh destroyed Mm-hmm. So and and Dante is aware of this, and and he writes in the Commedia, uh, the Divine Comedy. He is able to connect what is a crisis, what's a growing crisis in Italy, to the uh, usurious money economy. Which mm-hmm. <clears throat> this is the problem. This is the you know it originates in. Uh, 
um, in Venice, but you know Venice was the big player in terms of uh, banking and international banking. And then uh, he he also uh, talks about the well that was the introduction of the gold florin in 1252, and this became the the accounting currency for all the private banking houses of um, Bardi, Peruzzi, Frescobaldi who then, like the IMF or the World Bank, uh, they proceeded to uh, destroy, to loot and destroy the peoples of Europe uh, during, during this period. And then you also had the introduction of plagues with accompanying economic uh, uh, destruction, very uh, echoing, I think, our times uh, in, in a very disturbing way. And he feels very much that the economic policies, if you can call them that. I mean, it's so, just... So da Dante, just, when I, you say he, you mean Dante, right? Dante is... Yeah. Okay, great. He he is able to connect these, uh, these uh, plagues, especially with policies associated with uh, uh, those families that we associate with the, the, the Black Guelphs. And this was, so I'm just, I'm going back uh, just a little bit to see what he's witnessing and what is motivating him. So, uh, you know, by the time, so um, so there was Venice, Venice emerges as the number one economic uh, superpower among the Italian uh, city-states after mm -hmm after the uh, conquering of Constantinople. And uh, that was back going back to 1204. And then this leads the, uh, the way to the um, unbridled oligarchical looting of uh, Europe. And what Dante remarks, or, or what he remarks on is that this the, the destructive dynamic in this period was... Uh, arose from and was generated by this alliance of Venice, the church, and the Norman monarchy of England, which uh, also ruled half of France, the Angevin monarchy. So he is particularly uh, um, his ire is aroused particularly by the papacy and the church in all of this degeneracy. Right. And and financial looting, and so by the time by the time he's elected to public office in 1295 or maybe 1300, he becomes a prior before he is a member of the Committee of 300. So you had Italy and most of Europe had become basically, as the world is today, a speculators, uh, uh, an environment for speculation for speculation dominated by Venice, but also the Lombard bankers, and then you had the corrupt. Uh, papacy. So by 1290, you see the European population starts to decline. Mm -hmm. You see agriculture, wood, uh, wool production uh, has uh, collapsed mm -hmm. in many places, just the way you see what, is hap what happened to uh, Detroit. And interestingly, food disappeared in many areas. And now, you know, we're talking today about this Oh, the supply chain problems. Of course, we see the destruction of food processing centers and supply chain. Can I uh, can I interject on that real quick, Philip? Absolutely. I think that's a brilliant uh, uh, historical parallel that's eerie and creepy. And um, again, these methods that the Venetian oligarchs perfected during, you know, from around 1200 to um, the uh, League of Cambrai, they just uh, basically developed that tool set over that 300 year period with the Council of Ten and so forth, or maybe 350 years, something like that. And you just see it repeated again and again and again throughout history. And the, uh, the whatever, the war that's occurring in Ukraine, however you want to quantify that, Ukraine is the fourth largest um, exporter of wheat, uh, with Russia being number one. And uh, there's also huge amounts of exports from both Russia and Ukraine of um, fertilizer, which is uh, almost even more important than the wheat exports they do. And because of sanctions on Russia and because of infrastructure being destroyed in Ukraine, uh, which also big chunks of Ukraine are being sold to um, 
uh, big agribusiness companies, in particular GMO company uh, companies. And I will say, think whatever you want of Putin, just a, a fact is that he banned GMOs from Russia some number of years ago. That's just a fact. And we don't need to get into pro-Russia, pro-Ukraine. I don't want to go there. I'm just pointing out that um, there are massive, massive shocks coming ahead in terms of food supply uh, that are very, very, very much intentionally created by the same kinds of oligarchs who I believe are probably even the same bloodlines as what Dante was witnessing back in thir around 1300 AD, 720 years ago. Mind boggling. Please continue. I just mm -hmm. wanted to point that out and extrapolate on your point. Well, I will, I will say that I'm a, I'm a big fan of Putin and uh, a lot of people are, are yeah. unaware that this, yes, Ukraine is what was the, it's the breadbasket of Europe. Mm -hmm. And it was the United States that started this conflict back in 2014 mm -hmm. with the coup and chasing wow. out Yanukovych who wanted to go with the Russian economic zone. Mm -hmm. And, um, we see the the same kinds of uh, vicious, hectoring, nasty. Uh, you know, we saw the the genocide of uh, ethnic Russians in the eastern uh, Ukraine going on for years when no no one was paying attention. That same kind of nastiness one detects going back a very long way. The kind of nastiness that most people can can't get their heads around. And this is one way that they're able to continue because most people are like, oh, come on. No one's that evil. No one would do that. Oh, come on. Uh, and it's, it, you know, as, as you know and as I know, uh, yes and worse. <laughs> much so, worse, in fact. Much, much worse. And we're seeing also with, with fertilizer, you know, farmers are saying in the United States it's gone up. 400 percent in some places the, the 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 cost of doing farming and then there were farmers that i think up in oregon they were being paid uh one and a half times the price of the yes. produce to destroy the mm -hmm. produce and in or, some or just cases, not my understanding is not just were they being offered uh incredible sums but they also were uh that there was some kind of intimidation tactic and similar things are occurring in canada and then you see all these food uh, processing plants are being attacked and destroyed and simultaneously there's rollouts of like synthetic 3d printed meat which is just repulsive on the face of it worse than that is the insect protein which harbors tremendous amounts of parasites that are dangerous for humans and it has indigestible chitin which can sometimes be good i'm uh, th th that this is a bit contentious but chitin can also um in certain circumstances i'm not 100 percent on this whether it's just around bandages and chitin or whether it's uh, chitin in your bloodstream, but it seems chitin um, increases uh, 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 clotting. So the you know what that the, mm -hmm. the the cupcake that so many people chose to eat, um, and so uh, you know tying it all together, there's uh, you know this is a depopulation effort, which goes back to that episode two where we see that the myth of overpopulation. Uh, it, it comes directly out of the milieu of these Venetian black nobility guys. It was that, um, I forget the name of the, um, that defrocked Franciscan monk who uh, came up with that pernicious, pernicious idea like a full decade before um, Thomas Malthus, who's far more famous. And again, it's that Venetian English connection as Venice, you know, liquidated its assets after the League of Cambrai and moved mostly to Holland and uh, London and to some degree, to Amsterdam and London and to some degree up into uh, Germany. So, you know, all this stuff that Philip and I are talking about, the patterns keep repeating. It's like Mark Twain said, history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. And there's a reason for that. It's because of this very effective tool set that the Venetian black nobility, and in particular the Council of Ten, which is the proto-intelligence agency uh, that all the MI6, CIA, et cetera, are modeled after, that same tool set translates incredibly well into modernity. It just has additional complexity because of technology. But the, the fundamental principles of it are, are really unchanged since around the 1300s, whether it's bio-warfare of you know, Phil, Philip alluded to this, they were apparently throwing in uh, plague infected corpses 
into uh, communal wells and so forth in order to mm-hmm. the, uh, the Black day, Death intentionally to cripple up and coming political rivals throughout mainland Europe. So, yeah, please, please continue, Philip. I just kind of wanted to tie all that together and bring it bring it forward to modernity so people can see that it seems like we're talking about something that happened many hundreds of years ago or several hundred years ago, and we are. But what's important to note about all this history that Philip and I are talking about is the ways in which those templates continue to this day, and you see it happening right, right now. And that's what Philip and I want you to see. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the ways they keep getting away with it is promoting this idea in society, uh, as you just drew attention to, that people say, well, you know, it happened hundreds and hundreds of years ago. What they don't realize, the people in power in this world think very long term. Absolutely. Whereas we're, you know, people, so many people are living paycheck to paycheck. They're they're thinking 120 years in advance and they're thinking about five, six generations down the road. And Mm -hmm. most people just can't imagine uh, such uh, such a uh, such a mindset. It's well, beyond most people's capacity. But you can so, point them, you can point them to the fact that corporations have long term plans. The Vatican has long term plans. The the CCP in China talks about their hundred year plan. There was the project for the new American century. There's always ways to anchor these beliefs that people are find to be anathema. Like for example, you said, "Oh, so evil." There could nobody could be that evil. Well, one thing people were conditioned very intentionally about was how evil the Nazis were. So you can point to that. People might then try and fob it off that it's a historical aberration. And then you can point to various other atrocities that have happened throughout history that are, uh, you know, just well known. And you can start to say, but look, look at look at the genocide in Rwanda. You know, a lot of people know about that. Look at whatever. And so I always like to take the things that are emphasized cynically, like the evil of the Nazis, which isn't to say that the Nazis didn't do barbaric stuff. They absolutely did. But use that conditioning that has been uh, rubber stamped as okay and greenlit by mainstream society as an analogy for whatever's going on now. And that's when I, whenever I do that kind of stuff, I kind of use their already in place conditioning to bring a point, that's when you have the real cognitive dissonance and once in a while you get lucky and there's a break and they can see it. Yeah, I, you know, you may have, maybe you've had some success. I well, I have not, you know, people people have, been, yeah, people have been uh, conditioned to think, well, there's something wrong with the Germans, you know, it's some genetic problem, which was, you know, you know, that was part of a concerted program of brainwashing back after the war. That, you know, there's something distinctly wrong with them. And of course, we overlook uh, so many of the horrors that were, you know, like the engineered famines in in Ireland, yes. in India. My God, yes. you know, so we see this kind of evil cropping up. Um, so, yeah, so, so, so jump, I mean, cropping up regularly but at wide enough intervals that people don't are not able to connect dots and they fall for it every time. Who was it? Who was it? Hegel who said, uh, we learn from history that we do not learn from history. (laughs) It's very possibly Hegel, but that's uh, certainly a truism regardless of who said it. (laughs) So, yeah. And and this is just, this stuff just uh, leaps off, off the page. So you had then by, by 1290, you have a decline of population. All of these industries are collapsing. We have uh, food shortages, towns being abandoned. It's kind of like all those videos that are coming out of the United States. Like you wouldn't believe what's happened to this town. Look at these people on drugs, uh, walking around the streets like zombies. Look, there's no more businesses. You know, it's, com- it's complete mayhem. And mm-hmm. then you have... Uh, it was it's a downward spiral that we see uh dante growing up in the middle of this seeing all of this happen and and combating it um and so then uh, everything comes crashing down in in the 14th century mm. um but then you have the um 
the reemergence of uh, this is Dante dies in what 1321, but then his work, his his ideas, the power of his thought and his 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 creative spirit then reemerges and gives rise, gives form, philosophical form and impetus to uh, the Renaissance uh, farther down the road. Yeah. So uh, I, I didn't actually even realize um, until today uh, where to place Dante historically in terms of, I thought he was in the Renaissance or even like the later Renaissance beginning of the Enlightenment era, uh, which just goes to show, I, I feel like I have a better grasp of history than most people. And I had Dante off by a couple hundred years. I didn't realize what kind of a seminal uh, writer and, and, and mind, you know, Dante was. And like, thank you so much for bringing attention to this. I think it's really important. Uh, yeah, I did not, I didn't either. And um, as I talked about it, I think in the last episode, how any treatment of Dante now in universities tends to downplay or, you know, scrub all of this and simply focus very, very, in a very academic way on his, uh, his poetic process and his craft, but his craft um, that people say he's unparalleled. There's Shakespeare, and then there's Dante. You know, some people have this opinion, and and um, but this craft reflected as someone who was deeply involved, deeply responsive to these things, and sort of like as you think about when. Why do we dream? People say we dream so that our brain can sort of digest and process our experiences in life so that we don't lose our minds. And I feel like his, his, his literary output is kind of that. It's like almost in a dream state. And that's the value of it. Someone who's so uh, profoundly uh, perceptive and highly developed as an artist and so deeply involved and committed, putting his life on the line at this crucial moment in history. And he's, mm. he's responding to this the psychological stresses by creating these, uh, uh, these amazing forms that we, we share and we refer to uh, today. Uh, yeah. It's that kind of that twilight zone. I think, you know, like when you, if you've ever been between uh, awake and asleep and you mm. have these images, it's sometimes very powerful shocking you don't you don't know what you might expect i'm mm -hmm. sure that's happened to you i yeah. feel like it's kind of he's kind of uh surfing in this mm -hmm. zone between these two the the conscious world and the unconscious mm -hmm. and he a, a, and that's how he's coming to terms with it and his insights in that in that very uh deep creative state is then he offers that up he he's he gives that to us mm -hmm. You know, as an as an offering, which was basically the the center of his philosophy. You you do things for the next generation. You do things for uh, posterity. So um, I jumped back a little a little bit, and just to give a little background, there was um, in terms of the sorry, I'm a bit disorganized because. It's okay, you know. We're going at this as best we can. I didn't. Uh, I I wanted to kind of flow with the topic, mostly because what's truly important are the things that we're touching on in conversation as we go along. The parallelism with today, and without an understanding of what's happening, how can we fight it? How can we oppose it? Mm -hmm. uh, but just going back a little bit, you know, in terms of the Holy Roman Empire versus the papacy and this this drama playing out in Florence, you had uh, back going back to 1246, uh, you had the Emperor Frederick II, uh, who sent his son, he's Holy Roman Emperor, and he had uh, he had actually set up the new uh, Holy Roman Emperor, the capital in uh, Palermo, but he sent his son. Uh, Frederick of Antioch to rule Florence, and he's there for a time. Um, and Frederick uh, II was also ruling over Sicily. A lot of people uh, don't know that. Is Frederick and so he expels? Is, that, is Frederick II then the son of Frederick Barbarossa, the, the 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 which is sometimes referred to as the Second Reich in Germany? Interestingly enough. Um. Yes. Yeah, because then that, be the Holy Roman. 
Yeah, the Holy Roman Empire is the First Reich. Right. Well, uh, the Charlemagne represents the First Reich, oh. and the, Germ the Germans make a distinction because a proper German is then becomes the Holy Roman Emperor with uh, Frederick Barbarossa. That's my understanding. I might be wrong about that. I believe that Frederick Barbarossa is considered the, the Second Reich, or perhaps the Holy Roman Empire is as a whole is considered the Second Reich, with the first one being the classical Roman Empire. I, I, I'm, I, I might be wrong about that. Obviously, that leads up to certain World War II things, which is why I was bringing that up. But please continue. So... Frederick uh, II has his son there in Florence ruling. And yeah, so yeah, I wanted to also to get into the Holy Roman Empire, do a little uh, background on that because that opened up, you know, I said, well, you know, as I was getting into the research, like, wow, I've got to open up that uh, can of worms or um, these doors that go back, even back to the rise of, Germ of Germania, you know, um, you have the, um, was, uh, the Roman Empire, as it was collapsing, there was the threat of the Umayyad Caliphate, mm. which I know uh, I'm not that familiar with, but they, they're coming across the Straits of Gibraltar, they take the Iberian Peninsula. There's the Visigoths there. They're ready to conquer Europe. But you have the Franks who are uh, ready to resist this. And these are cousins of the Visigoths. Right. Who and have the taken Pyrenees, the Gallic too. regions. The Pyrenees. Yeah. Like, under no point really helps, you know, like so much of uh, his history can be derived as an extrapolation of a geography, actually. That's where geostrategic thinking comes in. And so you have the Pyrenees oh, right and the choke point on the Iberian Peninsula. So you have to get over the Pyrenees in order to get into the rest of Europe. Whereas going across the Strait of Gibraltar, you can just load guys up and do that. But then you have to go deeper into the Mediterranean to go around that. And there's a lot more time for the uh, Europeans to rally and be able to, to stop the caliphate. And that's my opinion of why that caliphate was stopped on the Iberian Peninsula was almost as much geography as it was the will of the Franks and their, with their uh, relatives, the Visigoths. Ah, yeah. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that. That's definitely uh, a huge factor. Mm -hmm. They could all, they all play in, you know, so you have the uh, Charles Martel, 732 stops the, or he's credited with stopping the the muslim invasion and then you have the con once that's done the continent is open for the uh, a frankish rule and then you have the fall of the western roman empire around around this time and then you have people uh, rushing in to fill the power vacuum right. and then so by the eighth century the western roman empire is under the control of these gothic kingdoms that had uh, been instrumental in defeating the empire, and so the Goths then settle into these this territory as nobles and administrators, and they develop um, their own form of Christianity, which I think might be uh, so you you probably know about this. Uh, I saw it referred to as Arianism. Mm. I'm sure you could uh flesh that flesh that out at some point uh, i want to so an episode on the scythians and the the goths and the germanic tribes and uh the scandinavians and also uh the peoples of the british isles um and the the, the saxons uh, are all it seems derived from this uh scythian so stock which is uh comes out of um interestingly that uh that black sea area but that's its own that's much more ancient history and um, although it bleeds into modern but the goths are said to be of scythian descent as well and that's where you get that aryan from because the indo-aryan language group is really uh comes out of the scythian culture which came out of the uh black sea region not to be confused right. with the Khazarians who come much later and are a, a darker right darker Turkic people, but um, actually the Scythians were apparently blonde hair, blue eyed and red haired and green eyed primarily. Um, and uh, in fact, uh, all, all, all red hair and blonde haired people, which I'm red haired, 
uh, and, and people have blue or green eyes, all of them can trace their ancestry back to haplogroups that come out of this uh, Scythian stock. And uh, the Gothic kings are supposedly part of that. So I plan to do an episode on that. I hope to get uh, uh, it, it, an incredible uh, channel called Asha Logos. You might actually be interested in that, Philip. Oh, um, yeah. I know this. I know this channel. Yeah, he's, channel. he's a genius, that man. Um, uh, I don't agree with right. all conclusions, but... Um, uh, he's an incredible, phenomenal researcher. I guess he has a team behind him. When I found that out, I found a little less intimidated by him that I found that a lot of his right. later works were done by a team of researchers. And I was like, okay, oh, yes. so this guy isn't just like three, you know, freaking orders of magnitude smarter than me. He freaking has a, he's, he probably is certainly smarter than me, but he has a, he also has a whole team helping him do his research, which made me feel a little little less intimidated by this man's colossal intellect but he he has a great uh thing on the scythians which i highly recommend uh people check it out there's going to be some controversial stuff in there um uh just because of like you know the the, the term aryan very loaded it didn't used to be it didn't used to be loaded in the 1930s and before it was not a loaded term at all it was just considered uh academic fact that you had this indo-aryan language group and indo-aryan uh mm. cultural uh group which st stretched from north india uh all the way into all those areas of europe that i just discussed and um you know an interesting thing um, and then i want to go back to this did you know that the uh, the greeks of troy and the trojans themselves they were blonde haired blue eyed and red haired and green eyed mm. Mm. they were not they were not the same people as the modern greeks the modern greeks were a much later wave of invasion just like you have Istanbul, not Constantinople, right? That there was Byzantium, then there was Constantinople, then there was Istanbul. Those were successive waves of invasion, just like you have the um, in the British Isles, you have the Picts, and then you have the Celts, and yeah. then you have the Saxons, and then you have the Angles, and then you have the Normans, right? You have successive waves of invasion. So I had always thought that the Greeks of the Trojan War would look like modern Greeks, but no, they were the Scythian uh, descendants apparently and if you go back to original source material then you can they're described as having blonde haired and blue eyed like achilles was blonde haired and blue eyed for example um and they very plainly say that and that was shocking to me uh when i discovered that and so yeah that doesn't surprise me that the goths would d be described as having an aryan uh, christianity uh, and, and these Germanic tribes uh, fought against the um, Romans. They were that Scythian stock, whereas the Romans, by the time of the Roman Empire, were increasingly um, from the Arabic uh, peninsula and, the, you know, the, the black nobility, right? The Tyrians that moved there and became the Roman senators. Um, I forget who it was, but one of the great uh, Roman historians said, we're not really Roman anymore. We're something else because the original Roman stock that had the founding of the Roman Republic was really not around anymore. They'd been diluted by people who had come from the more ancient part of the world there on the Arabic Peninsula, uh, things like Babylon and Tyre in the Levant and so forth. So that was like a magnet for, yeah, you know, the oligarchy from all over the oh, Mediterranean yeah. at Absolutely. that point. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's interesting, you know, we might find that as we, you know, I, I talked in the last uh, episode, the, the, the first segment about uh, coming forward in time to more recent examples where these forces emerge in more recent uh, late 70s, 80s Italian uh, politics and coming forward to the present. Also going like a double movement, going back further into the past, which is we could do we could do them both simultaneously. It's almost uh, in a sense, it, it, it's natural to do that as mm -hmm. confusing as it might be at times i think it's important um because to take a long view of things at this point is probably very uh, a very wise thing to do mm -hmm. um i'm just looking ahead here to i had like a lot on what the, the holy roman empire i don't empire i don't know if we can if i have time to get into all of it we should what maybe you have uh, episode on the holy roman empire actually um i think i mean there's yeah, a for, lot to unpack there to put it mildly oh my god uh yeah what you have though i think just to sort of characterize it is 
this uh, uneasy relationship, um, a mutual dependency between the Pope and the Emperor, where the Emperor will come to the aid of the Pope on on uh, several occasions, as you had like like Charlemagne. Mm-hmm. Um, well, there's Pepin the Short, right? He's mm-hmm. this. He's the son of Charles Martel. Mm-hmm. And he cultivates a relationship with the church. Mm-hmm. And one of the things he does is he gives Pope Stephen II uh, control over uh, quite a few Italian city states that Pepin that he had taken from the Lombards. And so this gives some power to the papacy. But uh, maybe he's unwittingly setting the stage for this, some future uh, conflicts. So these are the papal states. But then it comes down to Charlemagne. He begins creating an empire to rival Rome. His brother uh, Carloman dies, and so this gives him a, a, a free reign. And so you had then his opportunity comes in uh, 795. Pope Leo the Third. He's this commoner. He, he's he's a nobody. He has no connections, and he gets he's he's the pope right and the nobility they're like ah we're not having this this person is just not uh not good enough he's not one of us um and they try to gently get him to abdicate because he just won't do they eventually threaten him they send these thugs to like put out his eyes so he flees but of course because he's he knows because Charlemagne's family is good standing with the church it's so it makes sense for him to turn to Charlemagne for help so Charlemagne agrees to help him but he returns to Rome and his enemies are there with sort of like uh, what would be the the what would today we would call it lawfare they have all these trumped up charges against him they accuse him of all kinds of things that he has to face when he returns um so he he then uh, from you know adultery perjury, so he swears this oath of purgation, and he says I'm proclaiming his innocence before God on pain of eternal damnation. So the nobles were not able to counter this, right, without impugning their own faith. So they're back. They have to back down. Most of them are ex- exiled. His authority is restored, and he holds this mass at St. Peter's Basilica, and he he rewards Charlemagne by declaring him imperato uh, Romanorum, right? He's, uh, I, maybe I said that wrong, but that's kind of in, in a nutshell, and this typifies, you see this uh, coming up um, again and again, uh, where he's, so Charlemagne, by being useful to the Pope, by restoring him uh, to his position, is given, is given this title, uh, this was controversial at the time because many felt that it was uh, Prin- uh, uh, Empress Irene in Constantinople. She had been, you know, it had been for 400 years, they had said, you know, the Eastern Roman Empire, this is co- this is continuity. This is the Roman Empire. Whoever's in the throne in the Eastern Roman Empire, well, you have to respect them. But Leo, Leo had just completely overturned this and uh, so Charlemagne had set this uh, precedent, and this establishes this uh, dynamic of of mutual uh, dependency. But even still, the church said that the title of emperor originates from the will of God, and there, by extension, uh, the Pope. So, can, can and I? And it was still for just a sec, Philip. Yes, I want to point out that uh, from Charlemagne's court. I'm not remember. I can't remember correctly if he if he's a if he's a member of Charlemagne's court or maybe his uncle is. But Hugh de Payne's the um, he must be he must in fact be since Charlemagne is around what era? Let's see real quick just before I put my eight hundred. That's when he's crowned on. So it's someone it's someone in his court, and it must be much much later. So because it's like two hundred years later, but. Someone who is a member of Charlemagne's court, one of his uh, probably great great grandchildren, something like that, is the man Hugh de Paines, who then goes on to found the Knights Templar uh, as a direct result oh. of ways of Charlemagne stepping in here. So again, you see how everything in history ties in to everything else, and it and and it ends up having an influence. And you can't just act like people like to act like history is a series of random accidents and events. And it's, it's not at all. It's so much of it is planned. And yes, there's crises and people take advantage of it, 
but things flow naturally from, from one thing to another. And so all this history that we're giving leads directly to uh, modernity in, in just a huge amount of ways. So Charlemagne gets found and it creates this interdependence between um, to where there's basically the divine right of kings uh, or the mandate of heaven, they would call it in China. But that same concept uh, is established to where the papacy is who can give the coronation for the true emperor. And that's really key. Right. And, you know, and just to just to reflect just for a moment on what you just said, I think we're taught uh, in school to see history as a series of discrete events that right. are often unrelated. And you just memorize these events. You're not encouraged to look at patterns. Right. Uh, you're, you're discouraged from looking uh, at patterns. Right. Um and now we're in a position of needing to see these patterns yes. and wake up to what uh, these uh, patterns imply Correct. that it didn't magically all stop. It must be still, still going on. Right. So uh, then, so this is how it starts with, you know, the Pope still has the, the magic fairy dust, right, that sprinkles on the title of emperor that, you know, Charlemagne feels he was a very de devout, devoted uh, to the office of the papacy. So he felt, he still felt that the title comes through the Pope and he couldn't, therefore he couldn't declare a new imperial uh, dynasty. Uh, and then also you had the problem of uh, Frankish uh, succession law, which meant that he was going to have to split his territory up uh, within a couple generations, you have the Charlemagne's empire com completely uh, devolving into infighting between these squabbling kingdoms, and the imperial title kind of uh, is 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 hollowed out, uh, except in a very except in the most uh, cynical significance. It becomes a kind of a bribe that permits the pope's uh, a degree of uh, political control. So. Uh, uh, then it, it, it falls almost off the radar with the assassination of Berenger, uh, the first of Italy in, in 924, who is the last nominal heir to Charlemagne, and then the title was left unclaimed. But then you had the coronation of Otto I in East Francia in 962, and he resurrects the title and by this time, you have East and West Francia had evolved very different cultures by this time. And so East Francia becomes known as the Kingdom of Germany. Mm -hmm. And you had an elective monarchy. The nobles were participated in electing the monarch. But Otto's father, King Henry, had circumvented tradition by he named his son the heir apparent. And he did this without consulting the electors. And of course, this leads to civil war between Otto and the nobles. They seek aid from West Francia, which is today would be France. And then he crushes the rebellion and then he goes to Italy. And uh, there's by then, this is Berenger II. He allows Berenger II to keep his title as king, as king of Italy. But Berenger is resentful of Otto, and Berenger launches a revolt, and he uh, lays siege to Rome. And so Pope John the Twelfth he petitions Otto for aid, and so you have the same similar situation. Otto races to uh, Rome, and he forces Berenger to retreat. And Otto meets with the Pope, and he swears an oath to defend the Church, and so then the Pope declares Otto Emperor of the Romans. And so by this time, there's no mention of any uh, Byzantines. Mm -hmm. But uh, Otto was not like Charlemagne. He was not um, terribly respectful of the Pope. In fact, when he was in Rome, he, uh, he <coughs> called out the Pope. He called out the Pope in, in very strong terms for his uh, depravity and worldliness and chastised him for uh, insufficient piety. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the Pope was, he had never been spoken to that way, uh, you know, disrespected by someone he regarded as just a, a mere mortal. So he begins to, 
plot and then against Otto and then Otto discovers the plot and he has John the 12th uh, ignominiously deposed. And so this set another precedent. So basically that a sufficiently powerful emperor could defy the Pope mm, uh, yeah. with impunity. And so it goes, it goes from there. Uh, and um, I'm <laughs> now I'm a little bit pressed for time. I wanted to finish up with uh with uh dante to to go back to dante um if that's all right with you did you have of anything course. to add there you would uh, you just would i thought about... you know i was going to say in a similar similar thing talking about sort of the difference between um the secular power of the of the emperor versus the uh i don't know the holy or whatever power of the Pope, uh, Frederick Barbarossa straight up goes it down into um, Rome and conquers it and puts a little puppet Pope on the throne and there's a deposed Pope and that creates a, um, a schism for a while in the, in the church because the deposed Pope still continues to try and uh, rally pow power uh, back to himself and wants to <clears throat> make his claim. And I think they end up making a deal and, and Frederick Barbarossa puts that other Pope back uh, there at St. Peter's and um, in exchange, uh, you know, sanctifies Frederick Barbarossa as the Holy Roman Emperor. If I remember my history correctly, I haven't <clears throat> looked at that in probably a decade, so I could be a little fuzzy on the details there. So take that with a grain of salt, viewer. But I, I'm almost positive about the Frederick Barbarossa. Right? I will say I am positive that he deposed a pope. I'm not clear on whether or not he eventually brings back the original Pope that he deposed, or if he just keeps his weak puppet on the, uh, I forget what they call the Vatican throne, but whatever that is, the seat there, mm. the Holy See, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, that's all I did. Yeah, it was, Frederick, it was Frederick Barbarossa who finally uh, succeeds in making the German Empire holy. Mm. So he's elected uh, Emperor of the Romans and King of Germany in 1152. <coughs> And he has to resort to a lot of politicking to get his way. But his that's his big break comes in 1153, again, via a pope, when Pope Eugene III appeals to him for assistance. So the papacy is having a very, and Rome is having a very dark time. There's a lot of rebellions and uh, revolts and uprisings after the failure of the Second Crusade. And the citizens had ejected the pope from the city and they were in fact calling on the church to renounce all worldly possessions. So Frederick Barbarossa signed the Treaty of Barbarossa. He promises to restore the Pope's position. And yeah, then there's, yeah, you're right. I'm just, now I'm aware of, of the time, but um, I mean, you know, so he, is, uh, he, says, such a he vast... promises. Huh? I was just going to say, this is such a vast subject. The minute that you need to leave, because I know that you're about to go to work and thank you so much for um, coming in so early in the day. But as soon as you need to leave, we can just wrap up there. And like, this is an ongoing series. It's, uh, you know, I'm just trying to I'm just trying to estimate. I, I really wanted to. But let me just um finish off this point uh, so frederick had, so so frederick had been an emperor elect and he hadn't been crowned in a holy ceremony so uh eugene had promised him that this would happen but then eugene the third dies and he's replaced by adrian the fourth who is not uh, quite as well disposed to this agreement and Frederick doesn't want to play along with the kind of ritual subjugation. And then Adrian's offended uh, because he doesn't feel sufficiently honored. So he has this hasty uh, coronation. But what's, what's interesting about all this is the dynamic, and I think this is reflected in down to the psychology of individuals. We are simultaneously spiritual and temporal beings. Dante felt that the the Pope was should be a light, a spiritual light, but that it was better to have 
an emperor to deal with temporal matters because what was happening, the Pope was excommunicating people. Excommunicating people but he, one of the tactics they used, the dirty tactics to get, uh, to, to get rid of the Ghibellines was to excommunicate them all so the Ghibellines could no longer uh, tax people. They could no longer extract uh, taxes. And of course, this you know, hollowed out a lot of their, a lot of their power. Mm. So, you know, I, it, it occurs to me also, you know, we have this kind of this double identity as, as, as human beings. You know, I've been watching a lot of these uh, near-death experience videos. I'm just, it's absolutely fascinating to me. And thinking about our, our eternal selves, that is non-so-called uh, physical, non-physical, and then we come to this world and, and we take it so bloody seriously and we're you know we're willing to do all these horrific things to one another and in the end we go back to this infinite the space of infinite potential and and uh, <coughs> the spiritual realm and this essential dichotomy in the nature of being a human being is also reflected in in uh, in this wealth ghibelline dichotomy mm. And I wonder if there's something like uh, deeply uh, on it. I know that I know that there is. This says something very deep about our the essential nature of of uh, of our of our humanity. And going back to where where um, Dante is, had become a party unto himself. So an individual dealing with reality and yet someone deeply engaged in the struggles of his time and working uh, doing his utmost to improve the world around him and this is the the drama of of dante and we're very privileged to see into the mind of a great artist who is not alienated who is not irrelevant, who is not struggling on the fringes, someone who is a driver of events, doing his utmost, and yet having this tremendous well of, of personal reflection that he's able to go into and, and, dr and dredge up or express um, uh, these, these hidden dimensions. It's almost like there's something similar to in uh, com Comedia, there's something similar to these near-death experiences that that you hear about um you often feel you know as i look into it i'm thinking my god how does anyone even survive this psychologically and physically the amounts he must have been an incredibly uh strong uh, i mean that this is an understatement because you have him roaming around 1306 1309 dante he's in uh, luca uh, Lunigiana, Casentino, he's back to Lucas. During this time, he writes in the Convivio, and possibly we he's begins in the Inferno. He describes the circumstances uh, of his life. He says, I have gone about as a beggar, mm. showing against my will the wound of fortune. Hmm. Barely I have been a ship without sails and without rudder driven to various harbors and shores by the parching winds which blow from pinching poverty. Wow. Mm. So, but he's not down for the count, you know, you have on uh, January 6, 1309, Henry of Luxembourg is crowned as the Holy Roman Emperor in, at Aachen, and he immediately says, oh yeah, I'm going to we're going to pick this thing back up. We're going to reestablish our traditional and uh, the, the legal authority over the cities of northern Italy. And so in uh, 1310, his army goes into Turin. And so Dante uh, finds out about this and he uh, rushes to be uh, to help uh, Henry VII. And he goes with the army from Turin to Asti and uh, Vercelli, Milan. And he begins to write this series of these open letters, uh, epistole, which are quite famous, rallying the support, trying to galvanize support for Henry's cause. 
And the first of these uh, uh, epistole, he's directing at the leaders of Florence, is Ecce Nune Tempus Accettabile. He declares the moral responsibility of Florence to submit to the emperor. He's thinking on a very high level, I think. Uh, uh, he's trying to reconcile opposites and his thinking is transcendental when he writes De Monarche. That's why people try, one of the tools they use to, 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 to take credibility away from people, they reduce them to something simple. Oh, De Monarche, he's just saying that we should have an emperor. That's the, he's just telling us that we should all be ruled by an emperor. He's just wishing that we could go back to the Roman Empire. That's all that this is about. Um, nothing could be uh, farther from the truth. So they, Florence refuses, of course, and he writes a second one denouncing them. And in 1311, Henry enters Milan, where he's, he's crowned king of Italy. Mm -hmm. And Dante goes to the coronation. He meets Henry. And for the next few years, Henry, they join, uh, they join forces at that point. Mm. And then in the spring, he writes uh, two epistole. He's urging Henry to take Florence by force and to seize the, the, uh, the, most, he said, the most wicked Florentines within the black nobility. And he, and he condemns Clement V for uh, political treachery and simony, and he issues, uh, Henry issues a, a proclamation then in December that year, he places Florence under the ban of the Holy Roman Empire, and he declares that the exiles, the Florentine exiles, including Dante under his uh, special protection. Mm. So then his army goes on, Brescia, Genoa, Vicenza, and then Henry's at Pisa two years later, um, and Henry then directs his army toward Rome. So then there's fierce fighting. He enters the city in 1312. At this point, you have King Robert of Naples, the brother of Charles of Anjou. I think I said Valois earlier. Mm -hmm. um, he enters the war against the emperor uh, for for his servant, who, that Charles of uh, uh, the brother of Charles of Anjou, and so. Uh, the um, so you see this alliance between the Angevin, the French, and the and and the and the Pope. Basically, it's very clear who's on which side. Um, and so then, there's, King Philip must be arising very, very, very shortly. Or no, actually, he's already in power by this point. Yeah, right. So, so um, that this was so, more the, the the German considered part of Germany or like East Francia that um, King Henry comes from, huh? It's the Algovan monarchy that is then ruling England, but then uh, ha at least a half of France that's providing the muscle for this whole operation, the enforcers, if you will. Uh, kind of as the United States is working for the city of London and the Boy, British it's monarchy. Interesting, because from a timeline perspective, King Henry is there in Rome in 1312, and then later that same year, uh, probably as a direct result of of this kind of stuff, you have. Um, uh, oh God, I just blanked his name, and I just said it. King Philip the Fourth of France and the Pope suppressed the Templar that same year. Ah, oh yes. Hmm. So I wanna, I wanna, like, I would love to, like, get down in the weeds a bit more and see, because I bet you dollars to frickin' donuts, there's a connection between the Pope and and King Philip, and King Philip perhaps supporting the Pope uh, in order. Oh, to undoubtedly. Yeah, and, there's a lot and, there. And I'm one sure. Hand washes the other. The Pope says, "Go ahead and suppress the Templar and take all their loot." because uh, King Philip's deep, deep in, in debt with the Templar at that point in time. So, yeah, interesting. Do yeah, you need, do so you need finally, yeah, I, I'm just, I'm just going to get, I, I'd like to get to the death of Dante. Yeah. Let's see please. if I can do it. Um, so in 1312, you have Henry's army attacks Florence and, 
and lays siege to it for six weeks. But then after about six weeks, Henry realizes they don't, he doesn't have the, the force necessary to take the city. So he withdraws and he uh, conquers the rest of Tuscany. And he then uh, occupies Lucca, and at this point he's preparing for a full assault on Naples, and he builds a ship, uh, he builds a, rather a fleet for a naval attack, and the army moves south, and, but it's there in the midst. He's crossing, oh, what happens to him? He died, unfortunately he dies of malaria. It kind mm -hmm. of just, everything comes to a stop uh, wow. on, in, 13, in August of uh, 1313. So then you have, because, with the sudden, uh, this death of Henry, the imperial cause, it disintegrates completely. His armies disband or the, they return to Northern Europe. And then uh, Dante, the next few years, he kind of uh, drops off the radar again. And it, as one, uh, one biographer says, his, his steps are lost in darkness. <laughs> hmm. And his hopes of ever returning to Florence are uh, vanished. And he lives uh, briefly under, in uh, Lucca, under the protection of a Ghibelline leader, um, Uguccione della Fagiola. And there's indications that he was working on Purgatorio at this time. But by this time, uh, Dante is seen by everyone, his friends and enemies, as the beacon of resistance. Mm. against the Algavan monstrosity. And so the mere mention of his name is an incredibly powerful figure at that time, uh, very triggering to the people in, in power. Um, and you had in 1315, the Algavan vicar in Tuscany, uh, Baldo da Guglioni, he condemns Dante and his sons to death by beheading. Mm. And when you had this uh, general amnesty that was declared in uh, 1316 in Florence for all the white Guelphs and Ghibelline opponents of this regime, Dante alone is not included in this amnesty. And it, at the end of his life, in fact, he, he does appeal for forgive to the blacks for forgiveness. He said, look, you guys win, you're the winners. Can, can I please, would you please, can you see it? Find it in your hearts to forgive me. And they, they don't even uh, respond. Mm. So, but at this time, Dante is seen as the spokesman for all of Italy. Mm -hmm. So he's recreated, he's created the language of Italy. He's, he's created modern Italian. He's fought for the values that will ultimately be the impulse behind uh, the Renaissance, um, you know, there were many people who supported the Emperor Henry, but it, he, Dante was the voice of this movement. Mm. So then he's invited to uh, Verona by the, Gib the great uh, Gibbonline leader that figures very highly in the Commedia, Can Grande della Scala, and he stayed there for three years. And it was during this time that he wrote the Monarchia and uh, began work on Paradiso. So Can Grande is a very important person in his life. He re uh, Dante revered him. He was a great uh, individual. And um, the... Um, I think he invites, hang on a second here. Yeah, so Can Grande was a general. He was a, a Ghibelline. He was motivated by the same, probably the same inner spiritual forces as Dante, which is why he revered him so highly, and there was this symbiotic fusion between the wills of these two men, 
and he had led his troops into battle. He had been leading troops for over 30 years, and he was also a sponsor of the arts mm. and, and learning. So from 1315 to 18, we see um, military victories on the part of uh, the Ghibelline leader, Can Grande, against the forces of the Angevin forces of uh, Robert of Anjou. Uh, and though they, they knew they could not overpower it, they, they succeeded in, in, um, in maintaining and expanding some, uh, some of the Ghibelline strongholds and so uh dante uh says of him in in paradiso he says even his enemies would be unable to keep silent about him mm. and in 1316 he issues his epistola number 13 he dedicates the entire paradiso diso to uh con grande but by 1316, or any any hope for a reform and purification of the church uh, were, were out the window, and the election of a new pope, John the Twelfth, who is a Frenchman and who stands for everything that uh, Dante ha, ha, has fought against for his in, entire life. So. Then we get into uh, de monarchia, but we just simply uh, don't have don't don't have time for it. Um, well, that might be a good place to wrap this episode because you're pressed for time, and that kind of uh, brings us full circle on the like sort of the the common thread throughout much of these uh, discussions and that this episode in both parts, which is, is you know really swirls around the figure of uh, Dante Alighieri uh, and and his profound importance to um, history and to these forces of history that we know as the Guelphs and the Ghibellines. Yeah, and De Monarchia, I think because the powers that shouldn't have been but were, they detected something uh, it, in its transcendental nature, something more threatening and more deeply subversive mm -hmm. than they could even admit. So they declared that this book was a heresy. And in Bologna, they uh, burned, they got all the copies of the book and, and burned it. Censorship. <laughs> um, so he, he also, in the end, Dante argues that all, all authority in, in, in human uh, political or communal life has to flow from this natural relationship with, with the divine law, with truth, yes. which is found in, this, uh, in, in, in the eternal nature of the human soul. Mm, I love that. Uh, rulers are not bound or controlled by the dictates of popes, or they should not be. Neither, they are also not free to just do as they please. A government only a government which is faithful to a true mission for the development of the citizenry is legitimate. Beautiful. I think that is the perfect place to end is on that thought by Dante. Yeah, that's a, that's the, I think that's the, the flame that we can take away from, uh, from this whole consideration, what, what we can go forward with lighting the way to uh, the next revelations as we continue to excavate and uh, speculate. And, uh, you know, people need to understand, I, there's a lot of things that I missed, a lot of things that I skipped. I mean, this is a very quick thumbnail uh, treatment of this subject, but I think philosophically we, we managed to... Um, bring this to a point and i think we always manage to do that I, I that's what i i love about uh working uh working with you because we know there's another purpose we know there's a higher purpose yeah that's right to, to all of this i think so and i think it's um and i really need to um end here as well time wise um but i would say that that purpose is is to look upon what um the the great historian Barbara Tuckman called uh, the distant mirror. Um, in fact, I have the her distant what? 
I what have is that? right here, which is actually about pretty much the same time period. It's called A Distant Mirror by Barbara. Uh, um, yeah, she's mar she's marvelous. Yes. Yeah, and um, from the distant mirror of history, we can see tracings and outlines of modern events through all the means that Philip and I have been talking about. And the takeaway I really feel for this episode is Dante's uh, statement that all all authority uh, comes from from a divine source uh, in order to be legitimate. And that is that you're moving in alignment with natural law. And if you see what the current events are, they're trying to move it so far beyond natural law as to completely invert all of natural law. And that is why, viewer, Davos will fail. The Great Reset will fail without a shadow of doubt because okay. they're moving in the direct opposite direction of natural law and they cannot succeed and if you look very carefully, and in the upcoming episode I'm going to do, that's not a Black Nobility episode, but talking about the end of the Kali Yuga, um, certain astrological events that happened in 2025 that align with that ending of the Kali Yuga, um, certain things where I see the Luciferian faction are putting certain things into place that you can see with certain technologies. Um, I'll give a little teaser here. Uh, in particular, the I forget what it is, the iOS. In fact, let me look it up real quick so I can give you the exact... Correct thing. Mm, so let me, oh, come on. iOS 2022, something or other. God darn it. it. I thought it would come up more easily than this. It's something, oh, it's driving me nuts. Um, oh, boy. Anyways, there's some crypto thing, and it looks an awful lot like 2022, but it's not. It's like IO2000022, something like that. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, off the top of my head, it's too close to 2022. My mind just can't uh, separate the two. Uh, but that is being put into place between 2022 and 2025 fall, and actually a big piece of it goes into effect this November. So I'm going to try and get this uh, uh, video out before then. And there's just a lot of stuff pointing to that the Luciferian faction's about to pull the rug out from underneath the Malak infection, which for regular people is going to involve uh, is going to involve a lot of chaos in our lives. But if you're yeah. able to navigate that chaos, then a much, much, much better uh, era, one in which uh, humanity, no one living, has ever seen, and that it's beyond anything that we've experienced as a species for 6,000 years when the Kali Yuga and the Malachians have ruled. And we're going to be moving in more alignment with natural law, not less. And so on that note, uh, with a doff of the cap to both Philip and Dante Alighieri, um, Philip, did you want to have any closing thoughts and then we'll wrap up? I have nothing to add. That was a perfect uh, summation. Um, I'm just looking forward to you know, now it, it, it seems um, the success or the way things unfolded in this in, in this show um, gives a green light, I think, to go ahead. And I'm looking forward to uh, more collaboration, Absolutely. Uh, more, yeah, following up and, and uh, following through. Absolutely. Thank you and for your time, Philip. And uh, thank you for coming so early in the day. And thank you, viewers. Um, and if you got this far, please hit like, subscribe, and then share it with anyone who you think will find value in this discussion Philip and I had. Uh, thank you once again, Philip, for uh, doing the heavy lifting in this episode, though I managed to still talk a lot anyways, which my uh, detractors will take great delight in, especially since I foolishly opened with saying I wouldn't talk so much. <laughs> Um, no, but it was, it's absolutely necessary and you really should, you know, you have to, uh, wherever your knowledge kicks in, you're, you're, according to Dante, you're obligated ah, to, you're well, obligated to, well to share it, was, it. It's not that I talk too much, it's that I have an obligation, according to the great mind, Dante, that I must interject and interrupt Philip. It's a, it's a, it's a moral and ethical duty, it's not some kind of proving myself to my deceased father who only valued uh, the intellect. It's nothing to do with that at all. It's not petty psychology. 
It's a divine mandate. I like it, Philip. <laughs> well, exactly. And and I and I I always feel actually I feel relieved when you can step in and talk about things that I have no idea about. You know, I feel like we're we're adding value for for the viewers when we're able to combine um, uh, combine our uh, our perspectives. It gives people more dimensionality, so it's it's wonderful. That's why I just want to thank you for having me on again, and it's been fruitful and uh, and wonderful. And it's great to see you, even oh, though you absolutely. can't see me. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Philip, and thank you, viewer. And um, until next time. All right. Until bye -bye. next time.